I'm so great to see everybody. <clears throat> great to be back on the ACU campus and uh, to continue this series. I wanted to announce to you that um, this fall, uh, our distinguished speaker will be a gentleman named Brett Biggs. Brett uh, is actually a Harding alum, and Brett was just named about four weeks ago the new Chief Financial Officer of Walmart. So he's an Executive Vice President, Chief Financial Officer at Walmart. And I've uh, tried, been trying to get Brett down here for several years, and Brett's agreed to come. He's very busy, but uh, we're thankful for that. So we'll, we'll make sure you get the information on Brett uh, for this fall. Also want to uh, reiterate the, the way we do questions here, two ways. We can do them live from the floor, or we can uh, have you text questions to me, to my cell phone. So at the appropriate time, at the end of Pat's speech, we'll have uh, my cell phone number up, and you'll be able to text uh, questions to me that way that I can feed to Pat. Or you, again, MC will have a microphone, and we can uh, get you from the floor. Um, <clears throat> it's really an honor every time we get up here to think about people who say yes to come to be with us. Um, Pat is no exception. I am very grateful. Um, I do not have a long-standing relationship with Pat. I heard him speak last year in San Francisco and was one of those people who stand in line after to talk to the speaker and just asked him within my second or third sentence, would he come? And, uh, and he agreed, and I'm so glad that he did. He's, a, he's an incredible man of faith, high energy, incredible talent. Uh, this morning in the, uh, in the class that he taught, I was, even though I've read his bio and I've, I've read about him, it's actually pretty amazing how he's touched almost all elements of technology um, that you and I experience every day. So I want to read his bio. Um, and give him honor uh, that's due him, and then Pat will come, and, and he's got some prepared comments, and then we'll do some Q&A at the end of that time, and we'll be done uh, at the latest at, at 1 o'clock. Pat was named CEO of VMware uh, in September of 2012. Um, they are the worldwide leader in virtualization and cloud computing technologies with 2015 revenues north of $6.5 billion. They're the fourth largest software company in the world, uh, they're known for their radical innovations in virtualization software. It's created enormous efficiency for data centers and all cloud and mobile services. Prior to Pat's role at VMware, he was head of EMC's Infrastructure and Products Group, which is a parent company to uh, VMware. This group is responsible for all of EMC's products, including storage, data analytics, security, management, data protection products, analytics, and a large majority of their revenue. Under Pat's leadership, their growth accelerated to more than $20 billion in revenue in 2012. And here's kind of a cool part. Prior to joining EMC, Pat spent 30 years with Intel. And in fact, we learned this morning that he went to work for them. Uh, were you 18, Pat? Yeah. Went to work for them at 18 years old. He skipped the last year and a half of high school and uh, started in a technology, associate's technology program in electrical engineering and uh, flew from Pennsylvania on the farm to California so he could ride an airplane. Maybe not had an intention of, of you know, going to work for Intel, but uh, they talked him into it. And at Intel for these 30 years, he had 15 promotions. He managed the development of the 8486 and Pentium Pro chips and many other microprocessors. In 1990, PC Magazine declared Pat their person of the year. He became the company's youngest vice president at 31 years of age. He was Intel's first ever chief technology officer, and at 40, he became a senior vice president of the company. He's authored more than 20 technical publications. He holds six technical patents. He holds degrees from Lincoln Technical Institute, Santa Clara University, Stanford University, all in electrical engineering. He's a fellow of the IEEE. In 2008, he was made that. Pat received an honorary doctorate of letters from William Jessup University in 09. Uh, he excelled in his career, and he kind of left his family behind for a while, and after several wake-up calls in his life, Pat brought balance back. In fact, he ended up writing a book entitled Balancing Family, Faith, and Work, published by Cook Ministries in 03, and a second edition, Juggling Act, was published in 2008. Here's the best part. Pat's involved in a range of charities, incredible man of faith. He's married to Linda. They have four adult children, Elizabeth, Josiah, Nathan, and Micah, two daughters-in-law, Carly and Rachel, and two granddaughters, Georgiana and Alice, 
a third grandchild on the way this summer. Um, he enjoys skiing, golfing, racquetball, running, biking, and time with his wife, kids, and grandkids. And uh, it is a distinct privilege and an honor to have Pet Gelsinger with us. Would you help me welcome him to the stage? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to uh, be here. Well, let me see here. Turn this one on, flip that one off. Okay, can you still hear me? Good, we're good. And uh, what do you think of my ACU colors? How'd I do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, uh, Dr. Money here wanted to steal my tie. He liked it, wanted to add it to his uh, purple wardrobe. So uh, life is good, but it is a pleasure to be here. I'm a deep believer in uh, Christian uh, education. Uh, we'll touch on as we go along and just appreciate, you know, I was uh, baptized in the uh, Christian church, so of the same faith tradition as ACU, so uh, just appreciate all that you do here in raising up the godly seed for influence in the marketplace and in the workplace as well as in the church place. Just uh, tell me a little bit more about myself. Uh, you know, I was born and raised as a farm kid in Pennsylvania. As I like to say, I started at Intel knowing more about cow chips than computer chips. Uh, a, a lot more uh, and uh, you know really have had a Cinderella career uh, and I uh, joined uh, Intel in uh, 1979 that is be that's before Intel was Intel uh, at that point and you know it's just been a uh, incredible ride uh, and uh, if you've used a personal computer or a Mac right and any of you in the last 30 years use one of those okay I worked on it Right, in some capacity or another. The last chip that Intel, that I worked on at Intel is just being introduced now. It's been six and a half years since I've left there, and I started the Broadwell chip series that's just in going into production and, you know, uh, now in the server product line. So just to let you know how long these technology cycles uh, go on, it really has been a Cinderella career, you know, from a farm boy in uh, Pennsylvania to being able to stand at this uh, presence of uh, such a technology leadership view. I was uh, with my uh, dad at a family reunion about 10 years ago. And, you know, dad is there with all of his siblings around the table. You know, dad and Uncle Edwin and Uncle Clarence and, you know, all of the siblings-in-laws and so on. And I look around the table, not one of my uncles has all of their fingers from a farming life. And I'm just looking at my hands and I'm saying, thank you, God, right? <laughs> it worked out okay. It worked out okay. But it truly has been a, a Cinderella uh, career, right? You know, became first CTO ever for Intel. Right, if you think about that, you know, Intel, you know, is a, this technology titan of the industry, a six billion dollar R and D budget, all mine. Yeah, right. Uh, I yeah, quite like that as well. And if you've ever, how many of you ever used USB? Okay, I helped drive the standard. How many you know, Wi-Fi? You ever connect on Wi-Fi? Yeah, that's one of the things that we uh, did uh, as well. And as noted on there, my personal goal was to work on a piece of technology that would touch every human on the planet in every modality of life you know, work, learn, rest, and play uh, at that point. And, you know, if you include all the different technologies I've worked on, we have about uh, three and a half billion people, three to three and a half billion are per persistently connected to the internet today, right? Seven and a half billion people on earth. So we're closing in on 50% of humanity is connected uh, today. By uh, somewhere uh, around 2030, we expect that about 80% of humanity will have a persistent connection to the internet. You know, we'll cross being more connected than since the time of Christ, right, in the next uh, five or so years uh, at this point. And those are the technology things that I've had just the extraordinary uh, pleasure of uh, participating in. Uh, EMC, it was, uh, you know, after 30 years on the West Coast, took a job in Boston working for EMC, running all of the products as president and COO uh, for them. My East Coast Pennsylvania family was thrilled when they heard I was moving to Boston. The black sheep is finally coming home, right? You know, after 30 years on the West Coast, so three years in Boston, my family loved it, my wife loved it, and then I was asked to move back to become CEO for VMware. And uh, at that point, it's like my family, like, <sighs> He's gone again, right? Never to come back. So, uh, but we're uh, definitely uh, West uh, Coast uh, folk uh, at uh, this point, and just really, you know, in so many regards, you know, have had just an extraordinary career in the class today. We're chatting. I've met with so many of the titans of the industry. Uh, today is a sad day for me personally. 
uh, my uh, lifelong career personal mentor, Andy Grove, uh, passed away yesterday. And I had a 30 year plus relationship uh, with Andy. So, you know, it's almost even hard to just mention it without tears coming to my eyes this morning. You know, what a great man and influence. And we'll touch on that again in our conversation uh, this morning. So, Cinderella career. Um, VMware, you know, we're uh, the fourth largest software company. Uh, for the, you know, a few of you know about us, a lot of you don't. You know, we're mostly in enterprise space. We do things in data centers. Uh, we have uh, this little company of 19,000 people. As I describe it, I'm the senior pastor of the church of VMware. <laughs> You know, I have 19,000 congregants. Uh, I was saying that uh, one time, and John Orkberg, the well-known uh, preacher and writer, was in the audience, and he uh, shouted out from the audience. He says, you know, Pat, if I paid my congregants as much as you do, I'd get most, more showing up, too, right, <laughs> uh, at that point. But, you know, I do think I have a unique role as CEO, and many of you are business leaders as, as well. You have unique roles. Right, as leaders uh, in those environments. And, you know, VMware, uh, you know, we're building software, you know, creating disruptive, innovative products. If you've used a website, have any of you ever connected on a website? Right, if it's not Google, Amazon, or Microsoft, it likely is running VMware software inside of that website. Right? You know, that's you know, the infrastructure software that builds and enables cloud uh, environments. I know I have a few customers here in the audience. Thank you very much. Right? Appreciate that. You know, we do have a quarter right now. Right? We run 90-day cycles. So if there's any business you could get in right, in the next uh, week or so, I'd appreciate it. Okay? Right? So my tech friends over here. So. Right? You know, I am taking part of a day at Abilene Christian University. You sort of owe me, right? So, um, you know, and I just say, you know, one of the things that I'm probably most proud of about uh, VMware and in the three and a half years I've been CEO uh, there is the values of the uh, company. And for those of you who are business leaders, the values and the culture you build at your companies outlast you. They're the most enduring thing that you get to do as a leader uh, in those settings. And these are the VMware values, right? We say we're an epic company with epic products and epic employees and epic partners, right? And E for execution, we get stuff done. Passion, we're this passionate, innovative culture. Integrity, we do everything with the highest level of integrity in all of our business practices on a global basis. We make our customers successful and we make the communities that we're in better places. Right, so epic squared, we're sort of a geeky culture, so everything has a square or pie or something in it, you know, but we're a epic company. And, you know, as business leaders, as leaders in the different settings you're in, I would challenge each of you to think about the values and the culture in your environment that you're creating as well. And to me, that's one of the things I'm most proud about of my tenure, right? And uh, we were just voted uh, the number 40 company to work in the Fortune 100 Best Places to Work uh, survey. And our values and the, you know, the things that we do in our communities was a key attribute uh, that got us that uh, strong uh, recognition. So values. So that's a little bit about me as a technologist and business leader, but even more important to me is as a Christian uh, leader. And you know the uh, you know I've just had just this incredible uh, uh, set of experiences that God has placed me in. And how can I use that to be a platform uh, for the kingdom? As I was speaking to the uh, class earlier today, soon, a couple of months after becoming a, a Christian in uh, 1980, right, I had accepted Christ, became a Christian, I felt this extraordinary call to the ministry. And it's like, I don't want to be a minister. I mean, I'm loving this technology, computer architecture, and all of these kind of things. You know, I don't want to be a John Orkberg or Chip Ingram or Francis Chan. No, right? You know, so I'm arguing with God for a while. After a couple of months of arguing with God, I laid a fleece before him like Gideon's fleece. And the, as soon as I did that, right, it was like the scales falling from my eyes. And the answer was, the workplace is your ministry. How many of you are full-time ministers. Okay, if you claim the name of Jesus Christ, you have said, I'm a full-time minister. A few vocationally, the rest of you as workplace, marketplace, home place, school place, ministers, we are called to full-time minister, uh, ministry. 
And, you know, with that, uh, this idea of the juggling act, I wrote a book on this a few years ago, and it really is how do you make it all fit? You know, how do you continue to live out your faith uh, in the uh, marketplace? How can you, in fact, uh, show up, right, to be that uh, full-time uh, person of ministry, even though, right, you know, my, my day job is make the M more successful. That's my fiduciary responsibility. But to show up every day as a leader in your place of worship, in your place of work, right? And God has called us to work that is excellent. We're not supposed to be good. We're supposed to be excellent in all the things that he does. My life verse, Colossians 3, 23 and 24, work heartily, yes, for the Lord and not for men, knowing that you receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you were, you serve. And to me, right, you know, it is way cool that VMware gives me a big fat CEO salary, right? Like most CEOs, I'm overpaid, right? You know, that's the rule of the road, right? That's wonderful. But I show up for work every day, working as my CEO is the Lord Jesus Christ just as each one of you should show up in your workplace working full-time for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, with that, uh, Linda and I have committed ourselves to a life of radical philanthropy uh, as well. I know a number of you as business leaders, as community leaders as well. We heard a, a minister speak a number of years ago, and or the minister of our church, his dad spoke. He was a, a physician, and uh, he uh, described the challenge that he and his wife had taken on early, that they would give an increasing percentage of their gross income to charity and the Lord's work every year. Okay, so you got that? An increasing percentage of the gross income every year. And they were, you know, late in their life, so they were over 60%. Linda and I made that commitment over 35 years ago, and now we're closing in on 50% right, of our gross income. And when we made that commitment, you know, the technician salary at Intel in California, it weren't much money, right? And today, you know, it's a lot of money. And, you know, well, I'm passionate about the things that we do in the technology domain, but if you want to get me really excited, let me tell you about the philanthropies we support, right, and the charities uh, that we support. This picture of Linda up here with some Kenyan kids, we helped to start schools in the Mathari Valley of uh, Kenya, and uh, this is about 13 years ago we started, uh, helped to start some missionary friends there. Uh, and uh, those schools now have 13,000 kids in those schools. And this year we'll probably get close to 20,000 kids by the end of this year in the schools that we helped start in Mathari Valley. Almost all of these kids have one, if not both, of their parents as AIDS parents. Right? We graduated our first high school class this last year of the graduating class of 46, 28 are in college. Now, again, AIDS parents, 28 in college, two studying abroad. You want to get me excited? Let me tell you about what we're doing with the things that God has given us. And again, a number of you are very successful business leaders. What are you doing with all the good gifts that God has given to you? I mentioned uh, Andy Grove as a mentor. Um, I was a young technician uh, at uh, Intel, and I was uh, working on finishing the 8386 chip. And I had the opportunity to present to the executive staff of Intel. Gordon Moore, Moore's Law, one of the most prominent figures of Silicon Valley. Robert Noyce, the inventor of the integrated circuit, uh, the uh, Nobel Prize winning inventor. And Andy Grove and a number of the other of the Intel executives were there. I was the young guy getting the chip out the door, and I chewed them out. You know, what a pompous little arrogant brat I was at the time. But the computers weren't working, right, to get my chip out the door. So I'm sort of yelling at them, fix the computers, you got to get this done, and so on. A couple of days later, I'm sitting in my office, and the phone rings, and I pick up the phone. Who is it? The voice comes back, this deep voice, baritone, Andy. Andy who? Right, and the voice comes back, Andy Grove. You know, this is the president, founder, you know, of the company and so on like that. And he starts shelling you with questions. What do you read? What are you studying? What's your career objectives and so on? Uh, uh, you know, I'm barely able to talk, much less form a reasonable question. You know, so those are lousy answers. Be in my office in a week with better ones. <laughs> you know, if the president says be in his office in a week with better ones, what do you do? You either leave the country or show up. Right, and that began a 30 plus year mentoring relationship with Andy Grove. And, uh, you know, his passing uh, yesterday is a deeply emotional thing. 
but I'm also committed to having that same kind of influence and impact in the lives of others. And again, right, many of you, particularly those in the faculty, right, particularly those in positions of leadership, the lives you get to shape for eternity, right, and the lives that they get to touch. You know, my son came to me a number of years ago as he was, uh, boy, I have a hard time getting through this, uh, but uh, uh, he uh, was going off to college, right, and he was uh, deciding to go to William Jessup, again, a similar but smaller school uh, out in the Sacramento area to go into ministry. He's a, he wanted to become a youth minister, and he comes to me and he says, Dad, you know, very apologetically, tears are coming down his eyes, and you know, so on, and he says, Dad, I'm not going to be rich like you, influential like you, or famous like you, but I want to go into the ministry, and I want to know that you approve. You know, you talk about one of those, you know, father moments, right? And usually, dads, we just screw those up, right? <laughs> right? But this one I didn't. I said to him, Nathan, the only currency that matters for a life is how many lives you will touch for eternity. And the career you're choosing will be far more impactful and significant than the one that I have chosen, right? And yes, I honor you in going into ministry. But that's the only currency that matters in the lives that we get to touch along the way. And that's why, you know, I'm so thrilled to see what you all do at uh, ACU. You know, a few more things, you know, why do I believe, you know, I became a Christian, right, uh, Revelation 3, 15 or 16, I know your deeds that you are neither hot nor cold, right, I wish you were one or the other, but since you were lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. That's the verse that convicted me, and that's the point that I said, I'm going to be hot for the Lord Jesus Christ and what, whatever I do uh, along the way. And as technologists, I get asked this question, I'm in the Bay Area, you know, the pinnacle right, of technological innovation, right, achievement in the world, right? I get asked this question all the time. How can you possibly believe? I was at a Stanford breakfast the other day, and I have the CFO of Stanford is challenging me, right, you know, on how I can possibly believe in this Christianity thing, right, you know, given my learning and achievements, right? You know, that's the community I'm a minister in. And I, oh, I forgot, on the last slide, one of the things, you know, that I wanted to point out as well here is this little picture called TBC, Transforming the Bay with Christ, an initiative, and you can go to the website, www.tbc.city, right, uh, that we've helped initiate. And three pastors, John Orkberg, Chip Ingram, Francis Chan, and I, with three business leaders, helped starting this effort in the Bay Area. Uh, three, uh, four facts about the Bay Area is now the richest area on Earth. Pretty impressive. One of the most influential areas on Earth, or arguably the most influential, Google's, Facebook's, et cetera, right? It's one of the least philanthropic areas in the nation and one of the least churched areas in the nation. My mission field is rich, influential, miserly pagans. <laughs> and our efforts at TBC are to unify the church, amplify works of service, and multiply the church uh, across the Bay Area because I too need a savior, and so does every one of those rich, influential, miserly pagans that are part of my mission field. And you too, in the Bible Belt of Texas, you too have a mission field that's been called to each one of you, right? You know, God's design, right? You know, it transcends our technology achievements today are trivial compared to the design that God has put on mankind today. And we're still just barely cracking the surface of understanding the true majesty of what he's done. You know, as Christian uh, leaders, you know, being a CEO, right, if you have one figure in scripture that you could go to look to as a CEO, as a business leader, is Daniel. And if you think about the life of Daniel, remember, he rose up to be second in command under three different pagan kings. I mean, that's like rising up to be the vice president of the Republicans, the vice president of the Democrats, and the vice president of the Chinese. Right, you know, right, you know, three different pagan kings, right, he rose up to leadership. And what did they say about him? They could find nothing, right, that could condemn him, right, for his position of leadership. And if there's one business leader for all of us as leaders in the workplace, marketplace, school place to look at, it's the life of Daniel. 
you know, the, one of my, my personal mission statement, right, has been, you know, this, you know, taking every one of my resources, right? You know, when I end this earth, I want zero left in the bank account, right? And use every resource, use it all up before I leave this earth, right, to impact, right, the world for the eternity of Christ. You know, the, uh, a CEO job is a very nasty, terrible, busy job keeping God on the throne every day, keeping family in balance. You know, Linda and I, we had, a, you know, we had, you know, about every year or two years, the wheels sort of fall off, right? And I don't know, any, you have the wheels fall off your relationship, you sort of get out of balance or something like that. You know, I wrote a book on it, so this shouldn't happen to me anymore, right? right? You know, I should never, you know, I, I'm the expert, right? You know, well, we had one of those conversations uh, just in October, right, uh, about the wheels falling off yet again. And, you know, this is what my last six months have been like, right? The largest acquisition or merger in the history of IT, Dell, EMC, right? Merger, almost $70 billion, $50 billion of debt. EMC is the majority shareholder for VMware, right? So essentially my boss, right, in this is getting acquired, you know, EMC is being acquired by Dell, so, you know, my uh, primary shareholder moves from EMC to Dell as a publicly traded company, and your stock price, I mean, this is like the score at the end of the football game, right, right, and you're the, the star quarterback, a CEO, how do you think I'm doing? Life sucks, <laughs> right, yeah. By this picture, right? You know, when you lose uh, 10 plus billion dollars of market cap from your shareholders, how do you think that feels? I too need a savior because this isn't the score that Jesus Christ is holding for me. He said, I'm doing great, right? And when I start each day, his answer is, Pat, you're great and I'm still on the throne. And do you, you know, I mean, I don't know how it's going to work out going forward. Obviously, we've had a few good weeks of trading. You notice there, we're up a little bit. We're at $52 a share today, so I can feel slightly good, right? You know, I don't suck quite as bad. But, right, independent of all of the travails, the challenges, the ups and the downs that you will face, you know, our God is on the throne, and he said, you are great, because I have made you that way as part of my creation, as part of my chosen uh, seed for mankind. Right? And it really is, you know, as you're going through, be like Daniel, right? Using every resource, you will be tested, right? And I'd say for Christian universities today, you might have noticed some of these different social issues rising up, right, against the new as uh, workers, uh, you, you know, leaders, business leaders, themselves. we will be tested. It is promised to us in the Holy Scriptures, right? And what is our job, right, is to be leaders like Daniel, throughout those experiences. And we are called to be these full-time uh, workplace ministers. And you know, with it, you know, we are given extraordinary opportunities to be leaders in the marketplace. We are all full-time ministers. We are God's ambassadors to the earth today. That is the sovereign call that he's given to each one of us in the marketplace. And you know, I'll just give you one little witnessing tool. You ready for this? You just do this one thing, you can have great witnessing experience in the workplace. You ready? May I pray for you? If you just use that one phrase, you can impact lives for eternity. And I've had atheists, I've had agnostics, people I know that despise my God, and I say, may I pray for you? They've never said no. Can you believe it? What do you mean? You're an agnostic, right? You don't even believe, right? You know, something like that. But in those times of need, right, you know, being able to be witnesses. And, you know, obviously we're given all sorts of opportunity as leaders to be these impactful people for Christ, right, to be able to share, right, a perspective uh, into our communities, into our churches, into our position of uh, leadership. And ultimately, the only currency that matters when you leave this earth, how many lives have you touched for eternity? Be a workplace minister. Thank you very much. Glad he came. Um, I think we're going to put a text in the room there. We're 
That was an abrupt ending. We weren't yeah. ready. We were oh, okay. Sorry. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what, should I wave ahead of time or something? Does anybody want to just start us um, uh, from the floor? Uh, a question? And we'll run a microphone to you. Sure, sure. Uh, and uh, you know, of the ministries that Linda and I have touched and uh, helped, uh, Stadia is another one that we're just uh, absolutely thrilled about. I had gone and spoken to the Northern California Evangelistic Association uh, at the time, and they were planting two or three churches a year. And I had, they had a weekend thing. And sort of like this, I went and was one of the weekend uh, speaker for them. And uh, at the end of it, I met with Mark Bigelow uh, at the time, a friend um, that, that we got to know real well. And he takes me through Stadia's church planting strategy, right? You know, how they pick a plant, how they prepare for a plant, how they prepare the planter, the spouse of the planter, how they prepare the team, how they launch, how they mentor, how they coat. You know, and I'm like, wow, this is good stuff, right? You know, they really got, you know, I'm an engineer, right? Show me the process, the disciplines, and so on like that. So he said, would you consider supporting Stadia, or uh, Northern California Evangelistic Association at the time? And at the end of the weekend, I, I, in my, you know, I'm, I'm a direct, blunt kind of guy. I said, no. Right? You know, it's not like I'll pray for you or some spiritual nonsense like that. It's just, no, I'm not going to support you. But if you decide to go national, I will help fund you to go national. And that was Stadia two years later. They uh, launched uh, Stadia. Uh, and uh, Stadia this year will plant about 70 churches across uh, North and South America. And about three years ago, Stadia formed a partnership with Compassion uh, International because Compassion will only plant church, will only sponsor kids where there's a church to provide a platform for the kids to be supportive from. So this year, we're going to plant about 25 churches in South America that, to me, it's like a community in a box because it's a church. The kids get sponsored. When the church puts a kid's show on, who shows up? The parents, the uncles, the aunts, and so on. It's like a community formation, right? And this is across Ecuador, Bolivia, Peru, et cetera. We'll do about 25 church plants. You know, we've now done about 100 church plants in South America. So with that, we're approaching, uh, you know, we're comfortably over 10,000 kids now, right? And uh, over, uh, you know, closing in on the 100 churches that we'll have planted in South America, in addition to about the 300 churches over the last decade that we've planted in North America through uh, Stadia. So you can go online and look at uh, Stadia. Absolutely th uh, enthused about it. Uh, my daughter got such a passion. She went to Bolivia. She harassed the elders at our church for almost two years until they agreed to do one. This last Sunday, uh, they announced that they're going to do a Bolivia church plant uh, with uh, Stadia. That that you know that they're going to uh, sponsor one of the uh, church plants uh, in Bolivia. So uh, you know it's one of the things that just really gets ex us excited. Uh, if any of you want to join us, I'm doing a trip uh, with Stadia as a fundraising a trip uh, for them. Uh, Linda and I are going in uh, October. Uh, we're taking a trip down uh, to, uh, I think we're going to Ecuador uh, for uh, that trip as well. But, uh, you know, if you have a heart for planting churches, which has to be the most sustainable and impactful way to bring people to Christ, and for sponsoring kids, right, you know, for eternity, yeah, it's a great work. Pat, I have uh, several questions. Everybody wants to know, what's the next big technological advance yeah yeah so uh you know technology you know again I'm, I'm a geek i love technology uh and uh you know in one of my talks i uh uh speak about uh, artificial intelligence and the whole area of artificial intelligence sort of had its roots about 30 years ago and it was an absolute uh bust 30 years later it's no longer a bust Right, because data has gotten so big, compute has gotten so big with cloud uh, capabilities, the algorithms associated with machine learning, right, uh, data prediction and analytics, uh, artificial intelligence type predictive technologies has now gotten mature, right, to the point that to me, right, the combination of cloud, Internet of Things, this telemetric uh, kind of things coming together, it really is, is that we can start to predict everything. So the little scenario I gave this morning, you know, Rick normally gets up at six. Uh, tomorrow, he's going to get the phone call, right? His phone's going to start beeping at 5 a.m. as opposed to 6, right? It's going to say, last night, you had some heart abnormalities. 
So I'm getting you up early. I've made the appointment with the doctor. I've already uploaded all of your heart data, right? I've run the DNA analysis for that heart, right, condition that you had against, against everybody on the planet who has similar DNA patterns to you. Your doctor already has the information. I've made the appointment for you. Your Starbucks coffee has already been, you know, pre-ordered on the self-driving car trip on the way to the doctor's appointment. So you needed to get up early to get ready to go. Right, that's all based on this kind of machine learning, data analytics, insights, right? <laughs> Choose, you know, everything for it. And all of that will be real within the next decade. Everything I just said will come together, right, in the course uh, of the uh, next uh, decade. Now, uh, I'm right now living in fear of what's gonna happen next, but, you know, these <laughs> I are the- I feel really creepy right now. <laughs> yeah, right? You know, this, this, isn't, this isn't creepy, right? This is literally changing lives in very powerful and fundamental ways, right? You know, being able to touch every person in work, learn, sleep, play, every aspect uh, of your life, and technology will be doing that over the next decade. What? Interesting. Here's, here's a question. We talked about this in class, but somebody here raised it as well. Can you give your perspective on the, quote, fight between Apple and the U.S. government right now over privacy issues. Yeah, I, I think this is, to me, this is a great fight. I'm delighted that Apple is taking uh, this on. You know, not that I particularly, quote, like fights like this, but there's a important domain. Uh, and ever since Snowden, right, uh, you know, the Edward Snowden uh, breaches and disclosures that have uh, occurred, the United States has lost its moral authority. Uh, as a result, because we were going to Iran and Russia and China, and we're saying, don't do these things, right, in terms of espionage, right, data intelligence, you know, pursuit and so on like that. And all of a sudden, the Snowden disclosures were, I mean, you know, it wasn't that our hand was in the cookie jar, our whole body was in the cookie jar doing this, right? You know, it was essentially uh, the uh, disclosures. And all of a sudden, we could stay nothing to the rest of the world. Right, don't do what I've been doing and now have you know, broad evidence for uh, over the last couple of decades? Huh, how do we go and face the Chinese or Russians right, with that fact base behind us uh, at that point? And you know, the IT companies now, the presumption is when I walk into one of these meetings, I travel all over the world all the time, right? I walk into the meeting now, the presumption is the US government has built a back door into your product. We just don't know about it yet. Right, you know, guilty till proven as we go because we've lost that moral authority on a, a global uh, basis. And, you know, this is really a conflict of two rights. You know, sovereign governments do have the ability to say, hey, you know, if you're going to do business in my area, obey the law. Right? At the same time, right, consumer rights of privacy, right, protection of information, and the law of technology is never impede the progress of technology, you know, based on anything. Right, you know, continue to move it uh, uh, forward as rapidly as technology allows. That's what's made us great as a technology uh, leader on a global uh, basis. So it really is a conflict of two rights. And you know, I'm, you know, personally, I'm thrilled that the case is underway today because I think it will help clarify these really critical issues, help reestablish the moral standing of the United States as this uh, plays out, and allow us to continue to move forward as technologists on a global uh, basis, because we have been unquestionably the leaders of technological innovation on a global basis, the most powerful element of the United States economic uh, situation today as a result of our technology. Right? And that is something that, you know, both for economic as well as for world uh, leadership and world authority is something critical. Thank you. Here's a, here's a challenging one. Um, with all the new automation and technology coming out uh, today, are you concerned about how the common laborer will earn a living in the future? Well, you know, I think uh, there, there was a, a, you know, a famous, uh, a, a famous set of analyses that were done. Uh, you remember the steel industry collapse? Right, uh, and, um, uh, oh, uh, why, why, oh, his name just slipped my mind, the uh, famous the economist, he did a, you know, the most thorough study of that uh, period of the dislocated steel workers that met, you know, that was almost a million workers that were dislocated as part of that. And clearly that dislocation of the workforce was traumatic. Uh, but over 70% of those that were dislocated 10 years later were in superior economic positions. Not 100%, but on the order of 70%, right? 
right? And if you think about that, right, you're saying, you know, if I hold on to jobs for which technology is allowing us to move to more productive, more intellectual, more capable uh, domains in that respect, right, you know, should I just say hold on to jobs because that's how we have done it? Or do I need to have environments that allow us to keep moving forward and training and enabling, right, embrace of uh, new uh, technologies? And in many regards, I think it's a micro versus macro question, right? The macro situations, yeah, we need to be, you know, some of the most loving and, you know, careful people uh, in that regard, particularly from our Christian perspectives and our Christian faith to really, you know, honor our people and our workforce. But ultimately, you know, technology and the continuing advance of technology builds for a vibrant global economic position, you know, for us and uh, for our com uh, country and for the companies uh, that are part of it. You know, and trust me, a, a Bangalore worker, you know, they'd be pretty thrilled to have the kind of salaries that uh, most of you are paying your people for low Right, uh, you know, uh, positions versus you know high intelligent uh, uh, positions that many of them are in the, in that sense. So to me, it becomes a macro versus micro question where we need to demonstrate you know social causes at the micro level. At the macro level, we need to embrace, innovate, and continue to move ourselves forward in the most aggressive way uh, possible. Thank I you. Guess, I question. guess I'm a capitalist by heart. So. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, a little different uh, twist here. Um, Please ask Pat to comment on his advice regarding how individuals who are just entering the workforce can acquire the types of mentors that you've been privileged to have uh, and how us seasoned technology professionals can make ourselves available to serve as mentors. Yeah. Um, and, and then I would even add to you said two things in class. You gave advice to students in class. Here's two things you can do yeah. for your career. And if you want uh -huh. to pull those in, that good, would be good. good. So uh, mentors, a huge believer uh, in mentoring. Uh, you know, with Andy Grove's passing yesterday, uh, you know, to me a very sad day, but also one where I just remember how deeply, you know, my life was influenced uh, by the mentoring uh, relationship uh, that I have with him. I described mentoring with Andy Grove was going to the dentist without Novocaine. Right, you know, tough, demanding, driving, but he made me better, right? If I was 95% right, I was wrong, right? Because there was still more to be done. And for each of you, and I'll say, no matter what position in life you have, I mean, here I am, you know, I just turned 55. You know, do I need mentors today in my life? What do you think, right? I mean, I should be a mentor, right? I don't need mentors anymore. Right, you know, I have a mentor, uh, Steve, uh, who's a retired CEO uh, from the tech industry. We uh, get on the phone, he's on the East Coast every Friday morning, right, to uh, talk to Steve. He's challenging me, holding me accountable, both in the spiritual as well as the work uh, domain as well. You know, I still need mentors, right? Do you still need mentors, Dr. Money? Absolutely you do, right? And you know, Ecclesiastes, a thread of three strands is not easily broken. And I view that as a, you know, a mentor, a buddy, a peer, a partner, right? And someone that you're mentoring uh, as well, a Paul, a Barnabas, a Timothy, a uh, set of relationships uh, in your life, uh, respectively. And, uh, you know, so I have Steve uh, and I have a prayer buddy, uh, Gregory. Uh, we fast and pray together on Thursdays. So if you want to join us Thursdays as our fast and prayer day, we don't eat till lunch or breakfast uh, that day. We get together and pray once uh, together that day and always have a particular purpose that we're praying for. So a buddy along the way. And then a set of people uh, that I'm mentoring uh, and uh, pouring into their life uh, as well. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I would encourage each one of you to have somebody, a good mentor, is somebody who will give you time. You need some of their time. Right, you somebody that you respect, and that they have knowledge and domain, right? Uh, you know, domain relevant knowledge in areas that you want to grow and mature uh, in in your life. Every one of us needs a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy as part of our journey. And uh, for those of you, you know, uh, still just beginning your career, it's as valuable to those of you who are, you know, coming up on the end. Uh, of your time on this uh, planet. Uh, with regard to the other career advice I, I gave, I said, you know, if you do two things over and over again, you will be highly successful in your career. Number one, knock it out of the park in whatever job you're in right now. Distinguish yourself, rise above the fray. You work for the Lord Jesus Christ, he calls you to excellence. Be excellence, whether you like your boss, you like your job, right, you like the position, doesn't matter. Rise to excellence in what you're doing today. Second, Prepare yourself today 
for the job that you want to do next? What are the skills, the training, the learning that you want to be part of for that next assignment that you want to take? And again, this is no matter what position you're in. When I was a president and COO at uh, EMC, you know, I met regularly with the board members of EMC, and one of them, Jack Egan, he was the son of Dick Egan, the E in EMC. And uh, one day I met with him after a board meeting one time. I said, Jack, how am I doing? What do I need to work on? And he said, two things. He says, we're an East Coast company, Pat. You need to dress like an East Coast company. How, how am I doing? Well, okay. <laughs> All right, Linda, going to Nordstrom's tonight, you know, so we got to step it up there. But the second thing was, he says, you know, we're a sophisticated company, and you don't know how to do corporate finance to ever rise to the next level of this company. Hmm. Okay, Nordstrom's and corporate finance, and EMC got me a personal tutor, Columbia professor, right, Columbia University professor as my personal corporate finance tutor. So for a year, I took corporate finance. Linda and I took a summer uh, vacation that year. We're sitting on the veranda of our cruise deck. You know, she's reading some romantic uh, you know, novel. I'm reading the 1,100-page corporate finance textbook, right, you know, there. And I'm loving it, right, you know, at that point. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. But, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm preparing myself for the next thing. And you do those two things over and over again, no matter where you are, you will have a great career. Great answers, thank you. Uh, back a little bit toward family. What, what does it look like to be the CEO of your family as well as a, of a Fortune 500 company? I think it's the, it's the work-life balance question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So here you go. Yeah, you know, work-life balance, you know, I, I sort of, you know, the, a, a, a broken clock has the right time twice a day. And I think that's sort of like as you go through life as a CEO or in a position of uh, leadership, you're never in balance. You're always working to get back into balance. And you're always working hard because the job, right, your own ego and desires, right, you know, it's always, you know, how do you keep faith, family, and work in that order and priority? Put God on the throne every day, you know, prioritize uh, family, and then obviously be a great uh, employee and the steps to do that. Uh, Linda and I, we had the at-home chart uh, for uh, many, many years. We kept score. I'm an engineer. I need goals. I need scores. I need to win, right? So, you know, we had, you know, my secretary would mail us the score, right, of how many nights I was home, right, how many points I got that week. Yeah, literally. So, right, you know, home by 6.15 was one point. By 5 o'clock was two points. Later than that was zero points. Weekends were negative points if I was gone or so on. We have 30 years of mean, average, medium, skew, kurtosis, running average, et cetera, right? You know, you know we're going to keep score, baby, right? You know, I'd sit at the end of our, our, our street some nights, you know, at 6.10. I'm here on my cell phone, right? You know, 6.11, 6.12, right? Okay, got to go, guys, right? I'm getting a point tonight. Boom, you know, I'm not going to be late, right? Right, so, right for it like that. You know, but work hard to stay in balance. You know, those evening hours with family are magic hours. 6 to 9 p.m., you got to fight. You got to keep them precious. You know, dating uh, your spouse. Uh, you know, I, I, as I mentioned uh, briefly, you know, we had one of those wheel fly off uh, periods as we're going through this Dell EMC merger thing. I came, I was just so, I was fit to be tied in October. A lot of frustrating things going on, right? I'm treating my wife terribly, uh, you know, just being a lousy husband and, you know, working too long. Remember, I wrote the book. I shouldn't have this problem, right, uh, uh, for it. And one of those conversations we planned our two family, you know, we put, you know, family vacation, we're leaving for Cabo uh, uh, next uh, Tuesday. The whole family is going to Cabo. Uh, a, a cruise, we're taking a leaf cruise from Montreal to Boston in September. Uh, next March, we're going to uh, Brazil. We're going to do a cruise up the uh, Amazon uh, headwaters. You know, I mean, you got to work hard. Right, to put those family things in place. You know, we just had my wife's birthday uh, on Sunday uh, with our granddaughter, right? Granddaughters are just a great thing, right? Skip kids, go straight to grandkids. They're just great, <laughs> right? But you have to work at it, right? And just like anything else that's impressive, you, you got to prioritize work at, you know, build it into your calendar. At the CEO level, it becomes even more important to plan those things and put them into the agenda well ahead of time and then to really prioritize and keep them there. Great answer. Thank you. Uh, this is from one of our um, high school faculty. He said, in your story about Andy Grove, uh, you caught his attention because you had the guts to gripe at the executive team. So can you comment on the value of balancing chutzpah with humility 
in the marketplace. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, if I had a little white uh, board here, my theory of career progress goes like this. So imagine, remember, you know, just engineers, right? So this axis is the number of, uh, you know, it's the rate of career progress, right? Uh, and then the number of career limiting moves. Okay, you with me? Right, so at the origin, you're going nowhere, right? And you're not taking any risk. Okay, so obviously you're gonna take risk, career limiting moves, so there's a nice slope there of being of chutzpah, right, uh, as well, right? Your career is progressing more, you're taking risks, you're being out there, right, you know, so on. But then what happens is you get to the precipice and now you're just a pain, right? You know, you go too far and then you end up going below zero, right, in terms of rate of career progress and it takes you a long hysteresis to get back, get back to uh, uh, Gore. Are you following the graph so far? Right, so uh, uh, anyway, there's a critical aspect. I mean, taking risk, right, you know, being bold and so on, but at some point you're just a pain, right, uh, at that point. So, you know, the perfect rate of career progress is right there, just before the precipice, and if you get too close to it, you know, okay, sorry, right, at that point. But there is a critical aspect to taking risks, you know, being bold, uh, being uh, out there, uh, you know, with the projects, the situations that you're in, right? You know, as I view it, you know, I want people showing up in my office. I want them to have two things. I want them to have data, right? You know, facts, learning, understanding, insights, and a point of view. What's the right thing to do, right? And if, you know, that's the kind of people I want to culture, and that's the environment that Andy definitely, uh, you know, fostered uh, as a leader. You know, show up with real data, information, something that helps the business, the company move forward, and then I want to know what you think is the right thing to do as well. We may not agree, but boy, that's where I can really start having real learning and insights as we uh, interact with each other. So, right. And by the way, I'm working on the next book, so my rate of career progress is part of my next book. Okay, good, good. We got it. We yeah. got it here first. Last question. Um, uh, somebody in the audience asked, how do you at VMware, you personally deal with unethical behavior in your company? Yeah, yeah you know, uh, it, creating an ethical environment is really, really challenging. And I'll say here in the United States, you know, it's comparatively easy, right, compared to when you go internationally uh, as well. A couple of quick points on this is probably something that we could spend an hour just talking about this subject alone. Um, you know, if, 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 if you're the leader, your job is to demand and make this part of the value system, the culture of your environment. You know, this last year I had to let go three senior leaders from VMware. I mean, it just breaks my heart, right, that I had to let three senior leaders go over ethical violations, right, business practices, et cetera. And you just look at this and sort of like, you know, for 10,000 bucks, 20,000 bucks, you have destroyed your character. Is anything worth, right, you know, the destruction of a man's character, of his reputation, right, of his person at that point, right? And you just gotta drill that in from the top of the company 100% uh, of the time. When they arise, right, you gotta deal with them firmly. I mean, not, not that there's not forgiveness in those settings, right? And you know, what we're gonna do, I have one of my uh, business leaders who, you know, was just, you know, I just say he's over the line, right, on some of the things that he was doing from expense reports, et cetera. And boy, you know, I mean, he's gonna be a great leader for me long term, but he's gonna repay every penny of all of those over the line expense reports, right? You know, there's right, recompense, there's forgiveness, right? And then there's you know, continuing to move them on uh, to the future. Second general comment is for those of you who aren't the leader, right, but in those roles, it's important to realize that your job isn't to become necessarily the ethics or audit officer for the business that you're in. You know, your job is not to go root out evil wherever it may be in the workplace. Your job is to do your job, right? Now, if that impinges upon or you come across those things, yeah, you need to escalate and deal with those. That is part of your job. But, you know, if you suspect something over there, it's not your job to go find it, right? You know, if it comes inside of your domain of responsibility, absolutely deal with it. But you don't want to be seen as that whistleblower right, who's running around the company, right, and uh, creating more strife and issue where you don't have the facts, you don't have the responsibility uh, at that point, right? So this is one of the areas that's particularly challenging and particularly as we go internationally, right, China, India, you know, I have operations all over the world. You know, boy, hey, you ain't seen nothing, 
right? I had an operation in India. This was when I was with uh, Intel. It was about 5,500 people. I had to leave almost 1,500 people go over ethics violation. Can you imagine, right, the cultural impact, right, of having 1,500 people who were associated with that? I mean, it set the site back for five years, but you got to be very disciplined. No, nope, you know, this is our standards. This is our policies, right? You know, these are the behaviors. And it's something that, you know, we as Christians got to be also very careful in that respect. You know, this is where grace needs to come through more than anything else that we do because people already don't trust us in this domain already before we even start. Let's give Pat a round. What a privilege uh, to be here today and to be with Pat. Thank you so much, Pat, again. Um, oh. famous ranch just outside Telco, Perini Ranch. Yes. This is a cookbook that Tom Perini and his folks have written. So I want you to have a visit. And a bunch of uh, West Texas fixings. So all right, all right. All right. Um, as we uh, as we close our time together uh, today, we're going to have one of our students, uh, Matt Willoughby, who's a business student come and, and lead our closing prayer. Before uh, Matt comes up, just I do want to thank uh, MC Jennings and Frankie Montgomery for uh, the work they do to, to put this event on every spring and every fall. It is a ton of work. We were in small group Sunday night and MC was like, I said, how's your week look? Well, I've got a big event coming up. <laughs> you know? um, and they do so much work and I thank you so much. Can you join me in giving them a round of applause? And finally, I guess I'd say, um, just because my role has changed a little bit, um, I am just so thankful to be a part of the ACU community and for all the opportunities that it's given me and this community's given me. And um, we're taking that risk and uh, trying to uh, come up alongside men and women like Pat who are in the marketplace. Uh, can you imagine? I kept thinking, can you imagine if all of us actually took to heart the leverage that we have in the marketplace for good, for God. We change the world, and I think that's our call. And so just a privilege to be a part of this great university still uh, as a faculty member and as this community. And so thank you for your support of our program and of our students and, um, and all that uh, ACU stands for. Thank you very much. Um, We'll see, I hope, you guys in the fall with uh, Brett Briggs, uh, be our featured speaker, and we'll get that information to you. Matt, if you'd come and lead us in a prayer, we'll be done uh, for the day. And again, thanks, everybody, for coming to be with us.